Hi, DevWorld. Hi, Michael. So I work for a, I work at Savage. We're a company in Tasmania, and we work on an app called Procreate. We're a painting app for creative professionals and artists and people who need those things. Uh, we target exclusively iOS. Um, best experience with a pencil on a pad. Um, and this is what the main interface looks like. This is an awesome work by a guy called Nikolai Lockerstein. Um, from this point, I'll call him Nico. People do some pretty awesome things in Procreate. This is Stefan Brez's work with um, radial eco farms. This is a forest sketch by Sarah Webb. And this is developer likes to play with smudge. <laughs> <laughs> I made this one. You don't have to have skill to have fun. And the heart and soul of Procreate is the brush engine and the painting engine. We have heaps of brushes. We have pencils and charcoal and funny stuff and airbrushes and paints, ones that wet mix, all kinds of stuff. So this is a video from the Apple Pencil release. And you can imagine Johnny Ive talking about it. And he's talking about latency and responsiveness and how the pencil feels like a real physical device. It has a sense of physicality. This is an elaborate illusion held together by a bunch of things. By the sensors on the pencil, by a Bluetooth interface, by a touch screen, the operating system, down to the app with its performance characteristics, as well as uh, how it deals with predicted touches. And while this all holds, we get a good sense of physicality. And we can kind of tap into the joy of painting, at least for a little. <laughs> Splotching stuff on the screen. But you can imagine if in Bob's wonderful show, if as he was dragging the brush across the canvas, the paint couldn't keep up with him, or it didn't go on the canvas properly, it wouldn't quite be the same. There's a clear intuitive divide between smoothness and a connected experience and frustration and lag. And we do our best to keep on the right side of that divide. And we do that through our frames being low variance and short. All right, so today we're going to go through a few things. We're going to go through the major systems of Procreate and how we get paint to screen. Then we're going to get a little liquid. Um, this is a cool work by Miko um, Erola. Then what we build, we're going to make it fast, like this car by Faz Muhammad. All right, so we're just like any app. For the most part, we have input, we have output, comes from the pencil. One thing we do differently is not only do we render on the GPU, we also do a lot of our work on the GPU. Only a few intensive things are still on the CPU, such as our color drop tool, which is kind of paint bucket thing and flood filling. Everything else is GPU side. We also have this thing. The Apple Pencil is a veritable extrapolation engine. It's telling us about predicted touches that haven't even happened yet in, in order to try and anticipate when the frame will actually be drawn to screen. It's also got pressure data, which comes in after the location data, up to 5,100 milliseconds at worst case. It's also a first order lag measuring device. You take the tip of the pencil and you compare it to the stroke on the screen. You can measure it in millimeters. You can't really hide this stuff. As we're exclusively iOS, it also brings with it tile unit-based GPUs. These are some pretty wonderful things. They do some pretty kind of magic stuff if you're not used to them, such as order independent, sorry, order independent transparency, memoryless textures, which you can use for cheap G-buffers, but they also have some harsh trade-offs relative to desktop units. So memory. We'll use abs absolutely everything you give us, and we'll go ask Apple for more. We're a bitmap painting program. So everything you paint, everything you see, comes from metal textures, dense grids of color. If you slap a few of those together, you get a document. The document consists of multiples of these textures divided into layers, and we apply them on top of each other to present your final image. This is a robot that our in-house uh, artist, Will, is working on. And literally, the first thing we do each time an iPad comes out, we buy it, we plug it in, we soap test it, we keep demanding how much RAM it'll give us, we work out when it stops crashing, and from there we work out how much we can get away with in Procreate, and we apply restrictions accordingly. So the 2018 iPad, the one with the pencil that's not a pro from earlier this year, it's got two gigs physical. 
From that, things stop crashing when we ask for about one gig. So we use that. From there, we declare our working set. This is a reserved area inside Procreate uh, that we use for getting work done. This is a metal heap. Uh, we'll use that for stroke buffers and filters and stuff like that. And this is sized accordingly with the document. It's the equivalent of four color layers. We also have a mask, so we can work on just a selection of the document. Oops, and we have a composite. That's just a case we use for drawing stuff to the screen, and we'll talk about that in a bit. From there, you can use the rest of that rectangle for all your layers. These are all sized pretty accurately in terms of the memory they consume. And these layers are screen-sized layers. So on, on that iPad, it's about 2,000 by 1.5. So you can fit quite a few layers in there. But if you create a huge document, bigger than the screen, such as this one's 4K by 3K, and you create 40 layers, and you ask for one more, we'll say no. There's various spots in, in Procreate where you can do transforms and funny stuff where you fold the entire document in on itself, all the layers, in a kind of not completely predictable and coherent fashion. If we were serving these tiles off the disk, we'd get some pretty nasty performance characteristics. They'd be like steep cliffs. And that wouldn't lead to happy times. All right, incremental compositing. When you're viewing your image and you're not changing anything and you might be panning it around, we're drawing a single quad to screen. This is the composite. Starts with nothing. We apply each of your layers in turn, color, the base color of the robot, the line work, and some subtle color adjustments. And in Procreate, if we're not dealing with the entirety of the document, we're dealing with individual tiles. These are 256 by 256, and this is our level of work for painting, writing to disk, all kinds of stuff. And if you wanted to just touch up the shoulder just a little bit, we'd change that layer. We'd have to recomposite it, but we don't have to recomposite that tile. So we'd apply the background layers again, then the color, then the lines. So how do we affect change in the world? We'll do it on the GPU. So pencil goes down. We immediately take control of that working set that was in the bottom left. From there, we allocate a stroke texture, which is 64-bit, and a predicted texture, which is 32-bit. This is going to save our changes from pencil down through to pencil up. And it's important that we have 64-bit color, because if you're using a weak brush with low opacity, you're going to have real issues if you try to accumulate that by immediately jamming it into a 256-bit value. That predicted stroke texture, we're going to do some work to it and throw it away at the end of each frame. So from this point forward, you can consider Procreate a particle engine, just one where we care about the results. At the bottom, we've got the canvas. And from there, each particle we apply consists of two textures. The top is the shape, the middle is the grain. And we multiply those two when we're making the particle. You can consider the shape at the top is revealing parts of the grain. So on the left, we have our flat brush store built. And on the right, we've got that exact same brush, but we've turned up the spacing to comical and useless levels, just so we can see what it's made of, just the spacing. So those are textured quads, and we apply those in response to the pencil going across the screen. So let's take one frame for just a second. Let's imagine the pencils at the tip of that arrow. The black particles are ancient history. They've already been committed to the stroke texture on a previous frame. The green ones, they're ones that we, we now know about exactly. They're definite, we have to commit those to the stroke. And the pink one, it's probably coming up. Maybe the pressure's predicted. It's just for temporary. We're working in tiles, so we're going to apply those green, those green tiles to the stroke texture. The pink ones are predicted. Both are going to need to be recomposed immediately and presented to the screen. So. How that works, we start with nothing on the stroke texture. Pencil goes down, we start applying particles. It's got it. We copy just the changing tiles to the composite, and we draw that as a whole to the screen, as a single quad. Pencil goes up, we copy just the changed tiles to the layer, and those will be written asynchronously to disk. So, I've just got a debug built here, and I've colored the particles. 
everything that's colored is predicted. The purple stuff is when the pencil's telling us, I think I know where the location is, but I'm not even sure, I'm kind of making it up. It does an amazing job nearly all the time. That red stuff is where we know the location, but we don't know the pressure. Well, not definitely at least. That can be up to 51, 100 milliseconds. The green is us just maintaining smoothing. If we start really moving the pencil, you can know that that can be quite a significant portion of our drawing. And while 50 to 100 milliseconds doesn't sound like a lot, and it's not too much in human terms, in eight milliseconds frame, eight millisecond frames, that's quite a lot. All right, so now you know, kind of know enough about the basics of Procreate, how the systems work. A year ago, I gave up my life of bridges and funny shaped buildings. I jumped on a plane, I bought a three pack of these t-shirts and a puffer jacket. And I joined a tribe called Savage. And on the first day, in the first meeting, there was a slide. Welcome, Michael. Build Liquify. <laughs> this, is, this is almost accurate. It actually said warp, but that's less of a good talk. Liquify came after. So while this talk is very much about liquid performance, it's also about Liquify performance. What the hell is Liquify? Well, it's an awesome way to make birds' heads tinier. Sorry, Goro. This is an amazing work by Goro Fujita. I've spent so many hours liquefying this one. It's also an easy way to make waves. And importantly, in the hands of a skilled artist, it's an awesome way to rework and re like, retouch a document in a fairly non-destructive fashion without having to repaint all the strokes over. So it can be a huge time saver. This one's called Liquid Cat, and it's by Nico. And it's a really simple technique. You're going to learn everything there is to know about Liquify. But nobody's done an amazing job since Kai's power tools and power glue from the 90s. Nobody's done something that's kind of delightful and fun and playful. All right, so what isn't Liquify? Well, the first thing it's not is it's not a smudge and not a smear. These are approaches where we're picking up colors and we're pushing them along. This is a pretty destructive operation, and if you tried to modify your image using something like this, you'd end up with a muddled mess by the end. This is my sister's cat, Bobsled. He's a good cat. The second thing Liquify isn't is it's not a polygonal mesh. If your cat starts with two eyeballs, it should probably finish with two eyeballs. Don't use this approach. Um, even though the buttons in Photoshop say save and load mesh, just don't do this. So the good news is that Liquify is simpler than either of those things. We've got a source image, and we want to change it in a liquid fashion without touching that original image. So what we do is we introduce the displacement texture. The easiest way to view this, it, this is a glass lens that we can place in front. And we modify things on that glass lens, but we're never touching the original image. So let's say. We wanted to fatten that bird up and pull it across to the left. Since we can't touch that original image, what we do is we take the glass on the right and we point it that way. You can see these, these arrows as essentially pulling the color. It's that simple. So we've angled the glass on the left to kind of point to the right. Um, all our code examples, are, they're just going to be swift because the real code is too elaborate. But this is all we're doing. We take the source texture and that displacement texture, that glass lens at the front. We look up, when we're trying to draw each pixel, we look up in the displacement texture where it wants to point to. We go there and we draw it. This is literally all you need to know about rendering Liquify. But how do we change it? Well, we're a painting program, so we paint it. But when we're doing this, we're not touching the source image. We're painting on the displacement layer, that lens, that glass lens in front. And in theory, due to this non-destructive nature, though I'm actually just looping this video back and forth, it's completely reversible without kind of like things being combined together. So this displacement texture, they're two-dimensional vectors. They're float twos. They've got a Y, they've got an X. You can see them as little arrows showing you where to look up on the source texture. And instead of color, that's what we're storing. They're a dense grid. They're still a texture. 
How do we draw them? With particles. We plonk these things down in response to user input. They've got a location, which was always going to be in turquoise, and we're just going to show the middle. They have a direction in pink. They have an amount, which is generally controlled by pressure and a slider. For some of the, some of the controls, will be uh, done by time. And they also have a radius, which is just controlled by slider, and that's just the size of the brush. So an important thing before we get to kind of this slide. When we apply liquefy particle, we apply it to every single pixel in the displacement texture. Since that would lead to some absolutely monstrous diagrams, I'm just going to focus on one pixel each slide. It's always going to be the red one. All right, so in liquefy, we need soft particles with soft edges. Kind of looks like that kind of soft airbrushy feel up there. If you took a cross section, it would look like that. If you had harsh edges, you get this non, you'd introduce discontinuities, and it wouldn't be liquid at all. So all we're doing in this code, you don't even really need to care about it, is we're working the magnitude of, given the particle at the turquoise, how much of it do we apply to the red? From this point forward, you can imagine this being applied whenever you see the word magnitude. It's just because we're not using a texture, we have to reproduce that feel in code. All right. So first up, we've got push. And we're pushing from left to right. So what we're actually going to do is angle the glass on the right to pull co color from the left. Whenever we push, we take the direction of the particle in pink. We work out something based on that magnitude, the distance from it in blue. And we flip it around. That's what the negation is. So when we're pushing to the right, we're making the little arrows go to the left. So our displacement texture afterwards, I've just drawn kind of half of them. They're going to be like shifted that way after this particle. And yeah, that's kind of the nature of the whole, everything is kind of flipped. If we want to affect change, we have to do it on the glass layer, not the original. So instead of pushing color to the left, we make the glass point to the right. All right, so next up is twirl. And this is a clockwise twirl. What we do is you draw a little arrow from the turquoise, the middle of the particle, to the pixel. We rotate it a little bit, and we subtract it. We end up getting an arrow that goes around it. As you'll note, in the effect, it's going anti-clockwise, such as the reverse nature. All right, next up is expand. This one's really simple. We draw a vector from particle to pixel. We flip it around with a negation. And though we're expanding, we're kind of drawing the color out from the middle. Pinch is even easier. Same thing without the negation. We draw an arrow, and it keeps going. And this is drawing. The arrows are drawing stuff from, from the outside into the middle. All right, so it takes more than one particle to liquefy. We're going to walk through three. We're pushing from left to right. We get displaced by a little bit, going to the left. We update them, and we've done our neighbors as well. Second one, we're going further. Now, what we do is, instead of just pointing our arrow to where that red thing is, we're going to go, and we're going to copy the arrow of where we were displaced to. This has the effect of stealing the color that was in that particle, sorry, that pixel. So when we update that, we're going to go three to the left. Last one, we go a little bit, and we're going to steal where that arrow is going. We've gone the whole way. This is the fundamental algorithm of liquefy. For each particle, let's stop, update all the pixels. Whenever you read displace, just imagine it's that push function, that twirl, what we've been doing. We then add that to where we are. We go there, we take a sample, and that, we write that back to where, those red circle, where the red circle is. And because we can't read and write to a texture at the same time, we have to do this in a ping-ponging nature. We read, and we write to a different spot. We flip them around, and we do it again. As a performance optimization only, uh, we draw a box around our particles, and we update only that part, because everything outside there would have been magnitude 0. So we're already in trouble. This will get you a liquefy, but it won't get you a great one. We're targeting uh, tile unit-based chips. 
And they have some amazing properties. But one thing they don't like to do is write out to main memory repeatedly, especially not once per particle. So in this ping pong like nature, we are absolutely annihilating their bandwidth to a point where we don't have a good experience. When the user is actually moving their pencil fast, we have to make the choice to go really slow or just do an abhorrent job and skip. Those displacement textures, those are two, two component 32 bits. Compared to a color, lage, color layer, they're huge. They're taking up the entirety of our working set. There's not even room to write the particles. Like, this is bad. So the first thing we're going to do, and we did, is we reordered the loops. If you knew this was the answer and you're willing to move to Tasmania, come talk to me after. <laughs> so this is our loop. For each particle, for each pixel, do a pass, swap it. What we're actually going to do is do a single pass for each pixel, work out all the, apply all the particles. So if we're somewhere, displace ourselves according to a repeated set of particles moving along. Do a single sample of where we ended up and write it out. One pass. We've gone from a whole bunch of reads, a whole bunch of writes, a whole bunch of passes to a single texture read and a single texture write per pixel. We're in the game. We've got a big brush. We're moving stuff around. It's pretty smooth. Now I'm going to paint with the reconstruct brush. The eyeball rule doesn't exist when we're reconstructing. Um, and that, that feature is so simple, I won't even tell you about it. All that we're doing is applying a brush and making those arrows in the layer shorter. Nothing interesting is going on. All right. So this is James. He's our chief excellence officer and the designer of Procreate. I'm really happy with my work. I show James. He's really happy with my work. He plugs it into the latest iPad. It's 120 hertz. I'm not 120 hertz. Also, here's an Air 2. We technically support that, and we want to have a good experience. It can go better on that. It's pretty chunky and nasty on that to start with. All right, so scaling down. Through this talk, I've kind of, it's kind of seemed like we need one, one pixel on the displacement layer for each pixel on the color layer, a one-to-one. -one. What if I told you, instead of needing one-for-one, -one, we could get away and have an awesome liquify experience with a displacement layer that's only four kilobytes big, 16 by 16 pixels. All right. All right, we're getting some straight lines and an island. All right, I lied to you. That was optimistic. If you believe me, you're a believer. <laughs> and that effect is coming from, that nastiness is coming from literally, we have a tiny texture behind it. And those straight lines that you get to see, that's bilinear interpolation. We could cover that up a bit more with bicubic, but either way we do it, there's no good experience from this. But what we do is instead is we halve it in each dimension. For each four pixels of the source image, we get one displacement vector. And if we half the dimension, it's a quarter of the area. This reduces our work in a quarter. That full working set that was overfilling is now mostly empty. Quarter-sized textures, we've got a heap of room for activities. So symmetry. Claire's working on this awesome feature called symmetry, where you paint along and we replicate the brush strokes to elsewhere in the canvas. There's mirroring, there's rotating. It can come in a few flavors, two, four, and eight. And she says to me, hey, wouldn't it be cool if liquify worked with symmetry? We kind of laughed and it seems silly, because that's, that's ridiculous. Like, we're painting in eight spots on the screen. When we try to, like, not only is this eight times the work, when we try to draw that nice little box around them, like, that's not a nice little incremental box. We're basically drawing the entire screen every time. So the next thing we look to is particle spacing. At the top line, I've got a bunch of 10% opacity circles. Below that, I've got a third of the circles at 30% opacity. They're roughly equivalent. In actuality, we're using, like, really soft shapes. So that bottom line is that third circles with the texture applied. When we actually do this, we do this much less harsh. We tone it down until we can see the visual defects and we like take it away back from that. 
So this gives us symmetry. This is a cool work by Asuka called Neon. I don't even know how many hours I've spent working on this one. Just twirling it, reconstructing it. This is actually how the, the reset animation was born. Claire was watching me just kind of painted and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we animated it? Oops. So 4K. Up until this point, we've been working with document size textures, the size of a 12-inch iPad, which is about 2600 by 2000. And throughout development, that worked well, but we always had this Valkyrie as one of the stock images in Procreate. And it's 4K by 3K. And if you do the math, that's over twice the pixels. And this was always kind of chunky. It's divided into a lot of tiles if you divvy it up. And if we're doing a dirty great liquify and replicating it across the screen, we're generally updating all of those tiles. We're doing a lot of work. So this is our recomposite stage. And we're just like, just like painting, we're drawing to the displacement texture. We're recompositing it to the cache. Then we're finally drawing it to the screen. If we were draw, to draw this to scale for a 4K by 3K image, the arrows look a bit more like this. Because this composite, we're working in the full size of the document. This is 4K by 3K. It's a huge amount of work. While rendering liquify is cheap, blending every single layer on top of each other with the liquify can be expensive. So what we do is we throw that composite away. We just go straight from the layers through to the screen. And the cool thing about this is since we only need to fulfill the needs of the screen, we're working in screen space. We've gone from 4K to 3K, back to a 2.5 by 2. And this alleviates a lot of the pressure. So how do we get here? Well, first, we do incremental work by only applying the tiles we need to. We drew a box around our particles to only do the minimum work. We did a data-driven reflector. Um, you could consider this from, if you had a Haskell compiler, it'd probably do this magically. Um, it's data flow, functional program principles. If you've got a person called Lloyd on your team, he'd also do this for you. <laughs> so then we scaled down our textures that gave us uh, a four times improvement in work, as well as relieved our memory pressure. We tuned our particle spacing, cutting our work in a third. At some point, we rewrote the particle generation in C. Not particularly interesting. And for our worst case workloads, we switched to direct compositing to remove that caching intermediary layer and get back to um, working in screen space. So we've done a lot of talking, and it's a lot of effort as to like, how to get this one thing fast. But for a minute, I'm going to show you why we do it. Um, Thor Gear from Iceland has allowed me to share a bit of one of his videos. So let's go to drawing that. Turn on the additional symmetry. Okay. Now we tap on liquify. And then it goes like this. <laughs> that is just so cool. That is so freaking cool. That's the case. Isn't that pretty? Man, that's so awesome. 
So Thorge runs a YouTube channel, Art and Design, and he covers some really cool Procreate stuff. And, and yeah, that's all I got. Thanks.